I'm Kelly Harrell, author, animist, and creator of the Weekly Rune. Solenton Arts is my soul-tending practice, and you're listening to What in the Weird, my podcast in which I talk about runes, actionable animism, soul-tending, and how all of those intersect through sacred activism on my path. The Weekly Rune is out, and if you're not sure what it is, it's a rune cast that I've done for years, focused on the runic calendar and the current half-month rune. The Weekly Rune is now available in full on Patreon.com. Just do a search for Kelly Harrell to find it, and you can find the archive of all past rune casts on my site, soulintentarts.com. If you're not sure what a half-month is or what the runic calendar is, Listen to the early episodes of What in the Weird, or just go read the weekly rune. It's explained fully at the beginning of every runecast. Thank you to everyone who listens to the podcast, to those who send notes and share their experiences of the runes. That's what it's all about, and I'm grateful for the engagement. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters who make the sharing of my rune work through the podcast and the RuneCast possible with their financial support. If you've benefited from the RuneCast, the podcast, or the ton of free articles on the runes, animism, and soul tending on my website, you can show your support through buying my books, which you can find at soulintentarts.com or Amazon, by making a one-time contribution through PayPal or Square, or by contributing regularly through Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for Kelly Harrell. You can also subscribe to the paid version of the Weekly Rune there, and thank you for it. This is the hundredth episode of What in the Weird. In a way, it took way longer than I thought it would to get here, and it also seems like all this time has flown by. Thank you for supporting the podcast, supporting me, and for making the runes part of how you move forward in the world. That's a fabulous thing to see, and I do get to see it, because so many listeners share with me how my commitment to that end has inspired their own, and I just love it. Thank you. In the most recent episodes of What in the Weird and in my IG spots from the last few months, I've talked a lot about Folks, rituals and cosmology is shifting dramatically during COVID. Or at least, you know, feeling like their spirit guides or ancestors have ditched them. That's what I'm hearing most often. And I've talked about how we have to take the rituals from enormous to bite-sized to skittle-sized. I've talked about finding the sacred in the everyday, just scrap trying to invent things to be sacred and and make rituals that express this enormous sacredness. Find it in what you're already doing. And that this isn't just an exercise in cultivating animism right now. It's a requirement for how we deal with the way our lives are right now. It's a necessity. And I've talked about depression and the need for skills around tending long-term discomfort, and how in this culture we aren't just automatically taught those. And the thing is, it isn't going to change anytime soon. Just because we have this sort of opening and, and maybe a breath in how things have progressed over the last nine, ten months, we're still in a space where the old doesn't work, the new isn't here yet, And we have to be okay with a holding pattern and constantly shifting space from the middle. This as we approach Isa. Isa is the place of holding. Some folks characterize it as rest, but it's not the lounging on the beach with a cocktail kind of rest. It's forced. So it's more like It's more like locked in a room with all the supports you could want, but you've already watched everything on Netflix and you're starting to lose your shit kind of rest. You just want out of the room, but you're not 
realizing there's something in the room that has to be completed before you can leave it. It's like an escape room. No, no, no. Okay, so we've only just entered Isa. In the north, it comes at deep winter, which brings its own baggage around stuckness and not being able to have the freedoms that warmer weather brings. We've only just entered our usual limitations of this season, plus COVID, plus social unrest, plus full-on cultural collapse. Locked in a room until we get the peace that can lead us to the next room. It sounds like a recipe for a mental health disaster. Am I right? The dialogue that I've heard most leading into our time with Issa has been, curiously enough, about spirit possession. It's, it's not an unusual topic for this time of year because when we become more locked in with the weather, spending more time indoors, stuck with each other, we bring our shadow stuff with us. That, on top of a depressed culture in constant anxiety, is leaving people wondering exactly who's talking in their head. So that's what I want to talk about in this episode. When is it possession and when is it intrusive thoughts? I'm not a mental health professional. I'm a soul tending, uh, I don't even know what, that's just what I do. And I'll always be the first person to advocate that you need both. You need a firm foot in mental health support and another foot in soul support. They are different aspects of your inner cosmology and each needs its own attention. So regardless of the source of what's leaving you feel like you're not on your own team or maybe your team just got unexpectedly bigger and you don't really know who's on it, if it isn't controllable, You need to get help from a mental health professional and a soul-tending professional. It truly does take both. The big thing I've experienced and other folks have come to me about during COVID is depression showing up as intrusive thoughts. And what people want to know for me is, you know, when is it possession or just intrusive thoughts? So let's go. What are we waiting for? There are different kinds of intrusive thoughts. And the way that I break it down is into three different categories. Like when I'm walking through my quasi-diagnostic, what's really going on here stance, this is the way I look at it. And the first one is, they're just my own shitty thoughts. I'm not proud of them. I recognize them for what they are. They're not necessarily my voice. It can be a comment from my racist uncle when I was five years old and I didn't understand what he was saying. But the territory through which that comment emerges is still known. I I get it. It's his voice. It's from that time. I know what it is. I hear the thoughts. I feel where they're coming from within me most of the time. Not 100%. But I recognize that they're originating from within my own experience. It seems like a super common territory for intrusive thoughts is about body image. Yours or somebody else's comparing yourself to others or completely disregarding yourself for others or disregarding others. That seems to be really familiar territory for most people. But it can also be like... You know, oh, look, another cis-het know-it-all guy at the grocery store giving me advice I didn't ask for. Or it's me saying, I love you, and then the little voice in my head immediately follows it with, now please go far, far away. It can range from super toxic and expressing bias to benignly uncomfortable. The thing about these thoughts is if you give them center stage, they will want a bigger stage every time. So you have to just observe where they're coming from and where they hold and project bias about myself, about other people. And I greet them exactly as that, just shitty thoughts. If I try to ignore them, if I digest myself with anxiety about thinking things I don't like or or things that I don't even philosophically agree with, or even things that I know are factually inaccurate. I just let them roll. I just let them go. Just go with them. Let the thought come full bloom 
and then let it go. Yep, there's that again. Breathe and let it move through onto its next destiny. It is a life force. It is not meant to take up house in you. Breathe and let it go. Humans thrive on repetition. We repeat, i.e. obsess, about things and they get stronger. So if we beat ourselves up, the thought will become more frequent and more powerful. If we let it be, nod, keep going, and just emphasize that it was passing through, its influence over your thinking will lessen. Again, talk to a mental health professional about this one. It's okay to need someone to help you unravel a challenging thing that your mind is doing so that you can better target it to do the things you want it to. The second kind of intrusive thoughts come from what I call experience-born empathy. They're still mine, but they are disruptive. This is my wording. I'm I'm sure there's probably another way to phrase this or other people call it something else. But these thoughts are a lot like the above ones, but they come in with emotional baggage that isn't as easily redirected. For me. (laughs) So this is what I call my elevator scan. I am not joking. I can be in an elevator for three seconds and I can tell you who the serial killer is, who's going to faint if the elevator malfunctions, and who I'm going to have to kick in the face first to get out alive. I'm not even joking. I know. So again, it's not rational, not necessarily healthy, but it's not unhandy either. This is the kind of intrusive thought that comes with pretty useful foundation. You know, it's not maybe not necessarily good, but for me, it comes from being a sexual assault survivor, never feeling entirely safe in public, and not trusting strange men for a dime, and believing that other women will sacrifice me if push comes to shove. That is about eight piles of bias that I can spin into 12 different fully-fledged scenarios with plot, Props, dialogue, soundtrack in about five seconds in an elevator. It's the perfect fishbowl for that kind of empathy-based thought process. And what I mean by empathy-based is I'm drawing on an entire experience unconsciously to create those thoughts. They're not just originating organically in my head because my head does weird stuff. They're originating because of an experience I had that is giving me a a PTSD trigger-like awareness of something in the present. And my empathy, my felt sense of the experience that I'm in is drawing on thoughts based from the one I was in before. So... You know, with experience-born empathy, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be your own experience either. This is where it gets a little more complicated and yet still disruptive in your life. It could have been the experience of your mother. It could have been the experience of a further back ancestor that nobody even really told you about. You just kind of have this feeling that you never could shake, and yet it speaks up when you get in these specific situations and it disarms you with thoughts that you can't otherwise account for. And that's one place that this kind of intrusive thought differs. In the, the first example of just kind of like sitting with my own crappy thoughts, they don't necessarily gain unless you give them the stage to, to get bigger and bigger. And, and if you do, that can become its own problem. With these, though, these that come in with empathy, the empathy part is like all it takes is the arrival of that situation and you're triggered back to that point of empathy, the point where you can't stop feeling the felt sense of something that happened before, something that happened to someone close to you before. And it spins into this full setting visual. And if you leave that 
unacknowledged in the moment that it happens. It literally spirals in seconds. And when you start telling your brain stories, when you start spinning up who's the serial killer and who's the one that's going to throw you out the door, your brain amps up like the story is real. It doesn't know any difference. So when I'm running the movie of my elevator revenge story 12 different ways, my brain just takes me completely out of embodiment. I'm not grounded when I do that. And it can kind of sort of be a mild form of possession. It's not a full-on external entity that's completely taken me over, but I have certainly offered it plenty of territory to take up space in my story. It's mild. If I go eventually, oh, yeah, 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 I'm doing that thing again. Let me just make sure I get off on the right floor. But if I stew on it and it changes my day, if I let it get in me and start walking around and I can't stop rolling that movie, it becomes more than just an intrusive thought. Does that mean it's full on possession? If you let it go, if you let it go for days, if weeks go by and you can't stop thinking about that elevator experience, it absolutely can. That's where possession finds vulnerability to take root. You start attracting things that have nothing to do with your elevator story and they start to take up space in you that are completely foreign. That's a whole other issue. But it can be a shadow part. It can trigger the separation of a shadow part within you. And that is something that you need to see someone who does soul work to take care of it. Shadows form when some external event demands that you have skills or a response that you just don't have. And in the lack of that needed thing, some like street savvy part of yourself pops up and takes over in, in a way that gets you through the situation. It literally gets you through the thing. But it leaves you stagnant in some way. Because the workaround gets you out of the jam, your mind just goes, okay, that's how we do that. When that situation happens, this is what we do. We just go with it and run. And our fuller like inner cosmology doesn't ever get a natural opening to go back and relearn a better way to have handled it. So it isn't until later when that situation comes up at a time that we hope we have learned more skills and have greater awareness. And then we can recognize that as shadow. We can go, oh yeah, I don't have to, you know, respond the way that I did when I was seven anymore. And I can work through this whole situation in a way that supports my skills and the awareness that I have now. So if an intrusive thought spins off into a shadow part, we won't be able to just breathe through the thought. We won't be able to just diminish the power of the thought by letting it move through. We still have to locate the shadow part. We got to do that work. Then we got to breathe through any thoughts that are left. And no, that is not basic. That's, that's not basic stuff because you need a range of soul tending skills before you can even broach the idea of the fractured parts of the self. It can be a mental health thing, something that you need to seek out therapeutic support for, but it is definitely a soul tending kind of thing. The third kind of intrusive thought is it's not yours at all. It's not in any way originating with you. It is totally disruptive and it is growing. That is possession. When I say that to people, they're like, but how do I know it's not me? What if I'm just a truly horrible person and I can't tell the difference? That's an easy one. (laughs) We're all horrible people. We're all horrible people and we're also all phenomenal creatures with immense power to lift ourselves and each other up. We can be both. We really are both. So with that out of the way, You know your own trashy thoughts. Just stop bypassing them. Sit with them. Go, okay, yeah, I thought that. Breathe on it. Own it. Own the fact that you think dark shit. And don't let it define you. Let it go. Let it move on through. That is the healthy, porous thing to do. 
They don't reflect who you are as a whole person. If anything, they cycle aspects of the culture that you are in, the parts of it that just kind of get stuck in you whether you want them to or not, and, and you let them go by just breathing them through. But if you don't learn to do that, if you don't learn to sit with dark thoughts and realize that they are also life force that's just moving through, it, it, that is when you start to live as a horrible person in full. That's when you cross a line. So if you're being honest with yourself, if, you're, if you are um, embodied enough to ask yourself that question, how do I know when it's me or somebody else thinking horrible things, then you know, you know your normal bell curve of smut brain. You, you just do. When thoughts come that blow the roof off of that bell curve, or they're so tangential to who you are at core, they are not originating from you. If the intrusive thought in no way aligns with your experience, empathetic or otherwise, and it gets worse over time, whether you give it space or you're, you're constantly trying to breathe it through, it's not yours. It is not originating with you. If you're throwing everything you've got at it, therapy, soul tending and otherwise, and it's just not moving through, it's not about you. The origin is someplace other than you. And also, you know, this is a caveat of possession that gets overlooked. But if your thoughts offend the crap out of you or they scare you, they're not originating from you. And I know this borders into mental illness. Like, we can't deny that. There are some really good animistic views to take on spiritual factors in mental illness. And all of them play well with addressing it at a spiritual level and at a psychological level. You need a trained professional for both. Especially if this is a possession that has traveled with you for a very long time. If there has been a, a vulnerability in childhood that is now rearing itself in adulthood in a, a thought pattern that is deeply distressing, it's wise to cover the basis of that trauma in therapy and the current voice that's coming up in soul tending. The fact that these kinds of thoughts would filter through you means another life force is in your inner area. It's inside your etheric field functioning so closely to how you function that it's been hard to notice except for outbursts. And these kinds of intrusive thoughts need outside help. They, they are not going to just be breathed through. They won't go away on their own. When we have attachments to us, we don't have the emotional distance to do that work for ourselves. And, and I will say just doing therapy also won't be enough. This is one place where, you know, I, when I see people deal with this in therapy, it is phenomenal for aspects of self that need to regain power and confidence, but it isn't going to necessarily remove the life force that shouldn't be there to start with. Possession is truly one of the places that needs different attention at different levels, and it can weave into ancestry and other manifestations of self. It may not be all about this life right here, right now. It's not simple on any level, but we do have soul tech that can deal with it. The bitter pill of this whole discussion is we all have intrusive thoughts and we are all dealing with various levels of possession. We don't come into colonized culture clean. And unless we understand what we're looking for, we don't recognize the signals of possession as distinct from intrusive thoughts. I suspect that intrusive thoughts are human nature, like colonization or no, but the depth of them, I don't think, would have been as systemically rooted had we not been colonized. But possession, lingering dregs of trauma, I feel totally confident in saying that's a direct effect of colonization, being intentionally rent from our animistic roots and not retaining the skills to effectively deal with trauma, like being forcibly stuck by ESA and winter and COVID, and it all worsens this time of year 
for a reason. And that is the time to make sure that we're clear. It's like this is nature's reprieve. This this time with Isa is nature's reprieve to just make sure we are clear, as cleansed as we can possibly be before we move into what comes next. And the caveat of Isa is you can't move into what comes next until you deal with whatever the thing is that's just showing up as a pattern. This is one of those places where ancient wisdom matches up with that new age essay, I guess, on, you know, you, you're going to just play it over and over until you take it, until you deal with it. You're just going to take it with you until you decide you can put it down. And sometimes it takes some really specific skills and tools and specialization to be able to put it down. This is the time of year to try and get some understanding around what's needed for you to do that. It's also the time of year to examine where systemic forces of possession force their way back in, even with your awareness, and to understand what we need to do as a united front to deal with that kind of intrusion. And, and what's visiting us is living consciousness. Remember that. Feelings, thoughts, and any that don't move on, they create problems for us. Even if it started out benevolent. Seasonal affective disorder has animistic roots. And it also has animistic resolutions. So we have this space in nature now to examine the source of thoughts and feelings and maybe even get some help with them. And everything we can do to better embody ourselves puts us in a better place to leave the planet in a better place. Issa's half-month affirmation from Runic Book of Days is, I lie frozen, awake, sleeping only to dream what comes next. Thanks for listening. If you have questions or insights about working with the runes in season, or you just want somebody to bounce your ideas off, feel free to email me at kelly, that's K-E-L-L-E-Y, at solentinarts.com, or you can call into the Anchor app, which you can download for Android or iPhone. Also, check out earlier episodes by downloading them from Google Play or iTunes and various other podcast platforms. And you can learn more about me runic book of days and my work by visiting solentinarts.com or on instagram at kelly soul arts i'm kelly and this has been what in the weird